Well, thank you very much for that very warm welcome and uh, for that very kind introduction as well. I appreciate the um, spirit in which it was given. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to be here with you, although um, I will tell you this, that uh, now that you've given me a standing ovation, I don't know what to do. <laughs> this is kind of reverse order from what I'm used to. I have a granddaughter who's 12 years old who's just learning um, to do public speaking. And she's in a French immersion course, and uh, so she has to deliver her speeches in French, and uh, so I help her do that. And I was uh, helping her with her latest speech, which is part of the school division competition, and she usually wins her grade level in her school competition at 12 years of age. And this year she worked very hard on her speech because her speech was about, I am a survivor, she said. And she did all of it in French for five minutes. And uh, after, I was very proud of what she did. And after it was over, she said, so what do you think, Mushroom? That's our word for grandfather. What do you think, Mushroom? And I said, well, it's very well done. It's beautiful. You can start writing my speeches for me now. <laughs> <coughs> and she said, Mushroom, I have a question. And I said, sure, my girl, what is it? She said, how do you make them all stand up at the end? <laughs> So, uh, now that you've all stood up at the beginning, I, I, I'm totally confused about what to say to her about, about that. Um, that introduction was very meaningful. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciated the kind words. Uh, introductions are always a little iffy, though, because of the number of times I do public speaking and the events that I go to and the various crowds that I speak at. I was at a gathering one time of survivors in uh, Saskatchewan, shortly after we began the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And there were about 1,200 or 1,300 survivors in a large uh, convention room at a hotel. And I was being introduced by uh, a survivor who was trying to get everybody to settle down so that he could introduce me. <clears throat> and he gave the shortest introduction I've ever received. Uh, because he couldn't get them to settle down, no matter how many times he tried, he finally said my introduction in seven words. He said, shut up, <laughs> sit down, here he is. <laughs> Though it worked for me then, the, this worked for me too, but uh, thank you very much. My traditional name is Mzenigizhik. Mzenigizhik Ojibwe name uh, is what we call our spirit name. It's the name that the spirit who was placed within me when I was created carried and brought to me. And that spirit name means the one who speaks of pictures in the sky. It was the name that the elder who named me told me and told my family to remind me from time to time also reflected my responsibility to the people, and that is to talk about <clears throat> the things as I see them and to help the people understand what it is that I see. I am from the Fish Clan, and um, earlier we, we heard from a uh, representative also of the Water Clan. We all come from the larger Water Clan people. The Water Clan people are the handsomest, most intelligent, <laughs> most straight-talking, philosophical, beautiful people in all of the Ojibwe nation. <laughs> Algonquin people need us in order to survive. <laughs> and no matter what, uh, fish clan people are the, are the ones who are the responsibility of a certain aspect of the teachings of the Lodge. Uh, but unfortunately for me, my wife, Animkikwe, is a bear clan. So if you think about what it's like for a bear clan and a fish clan <laughs> to be married to each other, you can imagine what our relationship is like. <laughs> to her, she says, fish clan people only exist to feed the bear. 
I tell you all of this because it's part of what I want to talk about today. And uh, what I want to talk about today is the importance of knowledge and the importance of knowing who you are. Because it's the um, essence of our existence to know who you are. It's one of uh, Plato's big five questions if you studied philosophy and were able to get out of your philosophy course with your head still straight, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Knowing who you are is, uh, is the key to being able to enjoy the life that you are given to live. And enjoy is not meant in a kind of a happy, gay means. It's meant as a way of expressing that you have a responsibility to fulfill. If you know who you are, then you know what your responsibilities are, and you know what it is that you have to do. And you will derive the pleasure of success from doing what it is that you have been called upon to do. When uh, I was a, a young man, I went to law school because I had lots of questions. I went to law school beginning in the mid-1970s in order to find out why. I wanted to know why my family was the way that it was. I wanted to know why my community was the way that it was. I wanted to know why there was so much violence between the adults of my community. I wanted to know why there was so much violence directed at us by the non-Indigenous people in the nearby town where I went to high school. I wanted to know why when I graduated from high school and I was the top student of my class. I was elected class valedictorian. I was athlete of the year. I had A plus average marks and I went to university. I wanted to know why nobody would have traded places with me and been who I was. I wanted to know why people had such disrespect for us as a people and people had such disrespect for me without even knowing who I was, without even having met me. They treated me with disrespect in restaurants, in public, on buses, in taxis, in stores, and in universities when I started my class. I wanted to know why my grandmother and grandfather had raised so many children and taught us never to talk about our indigenous culture. I wanted to know why my grandmother and grandfather, who could speak four indigenous languages, plus French and plus English, never allowed us to speak any of our indigenous languages after I started high school, after I started school. I wanted to know why my aunts and uncles who went to residential schools never talked about their school experience. I wanted to know why my grandparents who went to residential schools and my aunts and uncles never went to high school reunions like all of the parents of my friends in high school did. I wanted to know why they never reminisced with their school colleagues about their school days. And I wanted to know why they had moved away from the community that we had been born into. I didn't know why, so I thought going to law school would help me understand, but it didn't. Law school taught me, in fact, of the glory of the English common law and the fact that we had so much to be thankful for, that we had such a brilliant and efficient legal system that would be able to give us answers to every single issue that society had to face. And I wanted to know why, when I left law school and graduated and went on to practice law, I was so unhappy with the way that I was doing my work. I wanted to know why I felt like I was participating in a system that had long oppressed our people and doing it so well that I continued to impress upon them the fact that they had to learn about the white man's law because I didn't know otherwise. And I wanted to know why I didn't know otherwise. 
I decided after law school, in fact, to quit practicing law and to go back to my grandfather's career, which was a carpenter, and work with wood because I found that more satisfying, less confrontational, less adversarial, more instinctive, more comforting. But I knew that there was something more for me than that. And I wanted to know why I carried that name, Mazinagizhik, the one who speaks of pictures in the sky. Law school didn't teach me that. It was when I quit law, or was about to, and my wife said, go and talk to an elder. And we knew who I should go and see, and I went and spoke to him. His name was Angus Merrick. He's long since passed away. But I went to see Angus because Angus had worked in the court system as a court worker, and he had worked a long time within the justice system. And he knew how the justice system worked and what it did to people, but he was also a very traditional man. He knew our culture, he knew our ways. He knew far more than I had any knowledge of. And when I went to talk to him, I asked him, why do I feel like this? And I told him what I was thinking. I told him how I was feeling. I told him what was going on. And I told him about my decision to leave law and to go and become a carpenter, to go and work with cars, which I found to be very fulfilling at a certain level. And he listened to me all day, I spoke. He listened to me for a long time, drinking tea, smoking his cigarettes, listening in the teepee in the back of his yard while I talked, and I cried. And I told him that I felt that though I was still very good at what I was doing as a lawyer, I felt like a failure. And what could I do about it except quit? And he said to me, you have probably completed your education in that world as much as you can. Now that you have this degree and can be a lawyer, he said, if you want, you can quit. You can go and become a carpenter. But that knowledge of law will always be in your head. You will never be able to put that aside. People will always come to you to ask you for help to understand those things that you know. People will always come to you and ask you to help them with the problems that they have. So don't think that you're going to avoid the responsibilities that go with the education that you have been given. But your education is not complete. He said, because you do not know who you are. And because you do not know who you are, you do not know how this fits into who you are, this knowledge that you have. He said, you don't know who you are as a husband. You don't know who you are as a son or a grandson or an uncle or an aunt, an aunt's nephew. You don't know how to take care of your family in the way that was meant for us to take care of them. You don't know your responsibility as a brother to your sister. You don't know your responsibility to the community as a leader because you have not been raised that way. You have not been educated in those things and so your education is not complete, he said. If you want to complete that education, you have to go and talk to your mother. And I said, but my mother has passed away. She died when I was a year old. He said, I'm not talking about that mother. I am talking about your mother, the earth. You have to go and sit with your mother and ask her to help you to learn. You have to put aside your food and your water and you have to ask her those big questions and she will start to help you. And then he said you have to find people who know the answers to those questions that she will direct you to seek answers for. And so that's how my journey on this road 
that I walk now today with you began. And that is by going and fasting and seeking answers to questions. By going and talking to elders who could tell me about the history of our people. Who could tell me, in fact, that we did have a history. Imagine my surprise when I learned at the age of 28 that we had a creation story and that it was not the creation story that we had been taught in the Bible. That we had a creation story that was as beautiful, as significant, and more meaningful, perhaps, because it came from our people, as that which was taught to the rest of society. And that story was ours. And imagine how I felt when I was told that our creation story was true. And that the creation story that others taught their children was also true. And that we had to understand that as part of our teaching and understanding about respect, that we had to respect everybody's creation story. We had to respect everybody's right to live in accordance with what they had come to understand their existence to be and to mean. And that was my first important teaching about respect and understanding and acceptance. I had been taught, of course, things in those areas in high school and in the Catholic schools that I had gone to and in university. But it didn't hold the meaning that that teaching from those elders gave to me. And so my discovery of myself began at that point. And it was enhanced when my children started being born because as I held each and every one of them, I realized that I needed to try to make their lives as meaningful as I could as well. That I had a responsibility to help them understand who they were. That I had a responsibility to help them to become as complete as they could be. To ensure that they knew their spirit name and what the teaching of their name was. That they knew what our clan was and what it meant. And that they knew who they were and where they belonged and what their responsibilities were. And to the extent that I could, that they also learned their language all of which was very important to our sense of self. That journey has been underway now for almost 40 years, and it continues even today. Every day I learn something new about myself because I learn something new about you and what you carry, what you know, what you have to share with me is part of who I am now. Knowledge is the key to our ability to survive. But survival is not merely about getting by. Survival is also about being strong. We have an expression in Ojibwe that talks about that. And that word is ngwamizin. Ngwamizin means be strong. Be stalwart, be steadfast, be determined. Do what you can do when you can do it. Do not shy away from your responsibilities. And go on as in. You have a responsibility to do what you can when you can. And so when we see each other in our family and when we part, we say that to each other in Guam is in. Be strong, be determined. In English, I always tell my kids when they leave, even though they're now in their 40s and 30s, that they'd stay out of trouble. And if you can't stay out of trouble, don't get caught. <laughs> Unfortunately, my middle daughter, who's the one with the sharpest tongue, says, Dad, if I don't get caught, I don't get into trouble. <laughs> So I got to think of a better expression. <laughs> and Guam is in is 
is about being faithful to your life, being true to who you are. And it is part of our knowledge base as indigenous people, as Anishinaabe people. It is part of who we are. Every tribal entity has a similar teaching. You have all been raised with a similar teaching in the way that you have been raised. You have that, you have been given that. You may have come to it early or late in life, it doesn't matter, but you have come to the, that understanding that your responsibility is to do what you can with what you have been given and to fulfill your responsibility to your family, to your community, and to yourself, all of which is the key to life. So knowledge is the key to life. It is the key to surviving. It is the key to life. Traditional knowledge for us as Anishinaabe people does not come though from the public schools. And in fact, those who have gone to public schools have not been able to benefit from being given any information about who they are. I went to public school and I was a very good student in public schools. As I said, I was the recipient of top marks in everything I studied. I was very active in sports. And I was chosen by my classmates to speak for them when we graduated. But when I left high school, I was not merely incomplete, but my sense of self had been destroyed. Because in the public school system, we were taught that indigenous people were inferior, that indigenous people were lucky that European colonizers came to this land and saved us from extinction, saved us from starvation, saved us from freezing to death by teaching us about science, by teaching us how to survive in a land that was so cold and so harsh and so difficult to live in. Never mind the fact that we had been here for tens of thousands of years before they came and didn't need them to survive. And that we were quite successful in the lives that we led. They didn't teach us that fact. They didn't talk about that inconvenient truth. They merely talked about the fact that we, as indigenous people, were very lucky that European civilizations had saved us. And it's because most Canadians do not know the history of this country. They know about the history since Confederation, that's well taught, but they know nothing about the history before Confederation beyond the history of the European arrival. And as part of that history, that talks about us as indigenous people being hurdles to the settlement of this country, being problems that had to be overcome, of being people who stood in the way of progress as savages, barbarians, pagans, heathens, those who were meant to hurt them or get in the way of them. So it was not that we had anything positive to contribute to the history of this country before or after Confederation. It was in fact that we held this country back from greatness until Confederation occurred. And then once Confederation occurred, we have been told, then this nation started to fulfill its potential. In the Canadian school system, they talk about this country achieving its independence from British colonial authorities as though that were an act, not merely of emancipation, but it was an act of fulfillment. That we were fulfilling some kind of destiny that we were entitled to fulfill, but not the indigenous people. We, in fact, stood in the way. Sir John A. Macdonald saw it that way very early on. It was his view that indigenous people were a problem and needed to be dealt with quickly. Before Confederation, indigenous people, of course, were self-sufficient, were organized into their collective entities in a self-governing way, and were able to take care of their own internal affairs quite well. And that fact, in 
in fact, was recognized in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which ended the French-English War in North America. England was so debilitated by that war that it needed uh, to uh, issue a proclamation or to appease the indigenous people of the North America to keep them from taking up arms against the English presence in North America because England could not continue to sustain a war against indigenous populations. So they issued the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and that Royal Proclamation was a, an act of assurance by the King of England to all indigenous people in North America, in which he says, we will not interfere with your lands, with your territories, with your way of doing things. We will stay out of your business and we ask you to stay out of ours. <clears throat> we ask you to let us live where we now live and we will let you live where you now live. And when you are ready to treat with us, when we are in need of your land, or when you wish to surrender your land to us, it is agreed that we will be the ones to purchase it so that we can continue to govern it. And that proclamation was issued, not simply unilaterally, but it was also circulated amongst the indigenous people who were all invited in 1764 to a gathering at Fort Niagara. 3,800 leaders from all over North America gathered at Fort Niagara in 1764 to hear that assurance from the Crown's representative that the King of England would not interfere with their lives. And that assurance became part of our Constitution by virtue of the British North America Act, as well as by virtue of the fact that it extended into the future of Canada. It led directly to the American War of Independence, which led to American independence in 1776 because they wanted the land. They didn't want to be controlled. But in terms of Canada, that law, the Royal Proclamation, continued until Confederation. And even now, continues still. As part of the British North America Act of 1870, which allowed Manitoba to become a province and extended Canadian jurisdiction into the West, Canada, before it could extend its jurisdiction into the West, had to enter into treaties for the land with Indigenous people in accordance with the undertaking by the Crown in 1763. And that undertaking, therefore, was intended to continue after Confederation. And so Canada did. And in those treaties, there was a promise that was extracted by Indigenous leaders from the Crown that the government would build schools on each and every reserve that was created by the treaty so that each and every community of Indigenous people would be provided with a government-paid school run by the indigenous people for their children because they wanted their children to be educated so they could compete in the new society that was being created by that new relationship. So when you look at treaties one through 10, every treaty has a schools clause that was entered into after Confederation. But MacDonald saw it differently. He was more inclined to follow the thinking of Egerton Ryerson in 1858, who issued a report in which he said, we have to establish a public school system for all of the children of the colonies, but indigenous people cannot be educated in those public schools because they are intellectually inferior. They cannot learn the same way that white children learn. Therefore, they should be educated in industrial schools they should be educated to be the workers for our society, the ones who are subject to the business elite who we will educate in our public schools. That's how Egerton Ryerson saw it, and that's how John A. MacDonald saw it. So he put together a plan, even though he was authorizing the treaties that were entered into after Confederation, which contained the schools clauses, 
He authorized the establishment of what he called industrial schools to take children away from their families and place them in those schools. Children as young as the age of five were taken away from their families forcibly, often against the will of the parents, and placed in those schools. And just imagine, if you can, that five-year-old who is in your life right now, and you have a five-year-old somewhere in your life, whether it's your daughter, or your granddaughter, or your niece, or the niece of a friend, or the daughter of a friend. You have a five-year-old little girl in your life. And imagine what it would be like if the government came and took that child away from you, not because you had done anything wrong, but simply because they wanted to indoctrinate her into a different way of doing things. And that's what the schools were. They were not schools. There was very little education that took place in those schools until the 19... 40s. People who worked in the schools were not required to have educational certification or background. They were employees, and their obligation was to teach basic writing, counting, spelling skills, but nothing else. There was no other educational program in place because they didn't have teachers until after the Second World War. And those schools, in fact, were centers for indoctrinating children into a different culture. Because from the beginning, the people who worked in the schools were directed that the children were to be civilized through Christianization. Churches were brought into the residential school system as managers of the schools. It was part of their missionary work, so they saw it as a way of extending their role in society as well, but more importantly, the government saw it as a way of them getting cheap labor to run the schools, because they literally worked for nothing. And those people who ran the schools indoctrinated those children severely. Harsh discipline was used. Techniques were put in place that kept children from being able to speak their language, practice their culture, continue relationships with each other, with their brothers and sisters. They were not allowed to talk to each other in the schools. They couldn't talk in their language. They couldn't see their parents while they were in the schools. They weren't allowed to go home in many cases, even during school breaks. Children were not allowed to go home to families if the parents were still practicing pagans, if they continued to attend ceremonies. So in 1885, the government of Canada passed an amendment to the Indian Act that said that Indigenous ceremonies like the sun dance and potlatch laws and any Indian ceremony was banned and was illegal. And all of those practices would result in people being prosecuted. It became illegal to wear Indian garb in public if you were an indigenous person. It became illegal to even do simple things like smudge a room to clarify your existence, to state your existence as an indigenous person. It became illegal to leave your community. If you left your community without a pass from the Indian agent, you'd be arrested and detained. And certainly you couldn't go and take the children out of the school. And if you declined to send your children to the school, you would also be arrested because of amendments to legislation. So after Confederation, the government of Canada waged war, just like the Americans did. The Americans did it through military might, the Indian Wars during Lincoln's era and afterwards were a big part of American history. But Canada's war against indigenous people was through law. We waged war through law. And imagine being subjected to that. If you wanted to challenge it, you'd go to court. Often that's the answer. You can hire a lawyer or go to court. Well, if a lawyer agreed to give you advice, he would be disbarred, unless he got permission from the Minister of Indian Affairs to give you that advice. If the individual went to court, the court could not accept an application unless the Minister of Indian Affairs' consent to being sued was filed as well. The minister never gave consent to being sued. 
And if you wanted to protest, if you wanted to travel to Ottawa and protest against this, it became illegal to leave the reserve, it became illegal to gather in large numbers. In fact, if three or more indigenous people gathered together for the purpose of complaining about the government of Canada's treatment of them, they were guilty of an indi indigenous or Indian conspiracy and could be prosecuted and jailed. Indian conspiracy laws were passed in the late 1880s. And if your leaders in your community were trying to lobby or trying to affect change because they were your traditional chiefs and traditional head people, traditional women leaders, the government had an answer for that because in 1891 they passed a law that said those traditional leaders could no longer speak for the community and only those men over the age of 21 were allowed to hold office, elected under rules established by the Department of Indi Indian Affairs. And they had to give notice to the Indian agent when they were holding a meeting and the Indian agent had to be present when they held the meeting and he chaired the meeting. And he kept a record of all of the decisions by the band council. So Indian archives were in the hands of the government from the very beginning. And so the right to protest, the right to go to court, were all taken away from you. Maintaining your culture was taken away from you, not only in the schools, but in the communities. And the schools and the communities suffered under this regime from after Confederation until relatively recently. In 1969, the government of Canada issued what it called the White Paper, which really was intended to complete the assimilation process by doing away with the Indian Act, by wiping out treaties, by wiping out the concept of Aboriginal rights and Aboriginal title. That was what the discussion paper proposed. And there was a huge standing against that by Indigenous leaders in the country so much so that they shut it down, that process. But the thinking that went behind it still exists today. Even though we now have in our Constitution of Canada a recognition of the existing Indigenous rights that Indigenous people have, there is still a large population in this country who believe that Indigenous people should not be treated any differently than the rest of society because of the way our public schools have educated us to believe. And it's the way that we have educated ourselves and the way that we have educated our children that we need to begin to change if we're going to have any significant impact in the way reconciliation progresses in this country. Because reconciliation is a process which is building. It's not a spectator sport, it involves everybody. And everybody is implicated in it, whether you like it or not. You are either for it or you're against it. No neutrality exists here. And when you think about it, you have to understand it. And understanding it is part of the educational process. And understanding the implications it has for you is part of the challenge that we also need to face. And all of that has to do with knowledge. All of that has to do with dialogue as well and developing consensus and agreement about where we're going to go as a country. We can no longer have the same kind of relationship that we've had since Confederation. We probably cannot have the same relationship we had before Confederation either. We have to talk about what kind of relationship we're going to have going forward. And that means we have to think differently. We have to think better. And that's where you come in. You are the scholars. You are the thinkers. You are the ones in whose hands we vest these challenges. My call to you is to think about this. What would you do if this happened to you? What would you want? if this happened to you. 
What would you ask for? What would you insist upon? What would you settle for if this had happened to you? And keep in mind that the answer to those questions are going to be the key to the future of this country because given the way that world events are spinning around us now, it is quite conceivable that Canada could be colonized again. Just think, if President Trump were to become our president, or somebody like him, and brought all of those external forces to bear upon this democracy as we know it, and insisted on this democracy changing to comply with those views of the world, what would you insist upon? How would you want to be dealt with? Because if you know what that will be, then you will have part of the answer to what we have to do now. If you do not know how to deal with this, you will not know how to deal with that. Something you need to think it through very carefully. We have a long way to go on reconciliation. It's not going to happen overnight. It's only been two years since the conversation really started. And we will see a lot of diversions and hurdles along the way. But we have to have a vision about what that process is going to be like and about what the end game is. The vision for the moment should be that we must have a relationship of mutual respect. But it must also include an opportunity for indigenous people to gain back their self-respect, which was taken away from them by this history, so that they can stand as equals in that relationship of mutual respect. And what are the institutional changes we have to make? What are the social changes we have to make? What are the legal changes we have to make? And what are the academic and educational changes that we have to make? So you've got five minutes, so figure it out. <laughs> but keep in mind that this is going to be a, a process in which we will be trying things as we go forward. So let's not be afraid to try. Let us not be afraid to try. Things cannot be worse than the way that they have been or that they are. We have a situation now where across this country, the largest single group of people being incarcerated in our jails are indigenous men and indigenous women and indigenous youth. Almost 50% of the children who are in care in Canada who have been apprehended by child welfare authorities are indigenous children. And yet we represent less than 5% of the population. Suicide rates in indigenous communities by people under the age of 30 are 10 times the rate they are for the rest of the population. We have indigenous people who are giving up hope. Indigenous youth who see no future for themselves. And the high school dropout rates are still the highest in the country for indigenous youth higher than they should be, higher than we could make them be. And we need to do better. And we can do better. Thank you very much for letting me be part of your morning and for listening. And I did indicate that I would be available for questions and answers, although I know that I've given you all of the answers. So. <laughs> because in reality, all of the answers lie within you. They do. You figure, you figure it out because you have the capacity to figure this out. But I'm here to help you. Thank you. I guess we have to share this.
So as the Senator said, we're going to open the floor up for questions. Uh, there are microphones here and also in that aisle. And try to keep your uh, questions brief so we can get through as many as we can in the time we have. And there'll be lots of opportunity for discussions later in the breakout groups and via the panel. Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for making the time to be here, sir. Uh, there was a person who you spoke to at his untimely passing who I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about what you learned from him and from his experiences as you learn every day. Uh, he was very kind to me and inspired me to do this type of work that many of us do. Uh, the late Howard Pauley, who was the former Premier of Manitoba. He was actually from here. Um, if you would, please. Why don't you ask me a two-minute question? <laughs> um, yeah, Howard Pauley was a, a good friend um, who gave me the opportunity to be his executive assistant while he was a Minister of Justice of Manitoba. And I worked for him um, for the better part of four years uh, before I went to law school. And even after I started law school, I still worked for him in the summertime. Um, Howard was an exceptional human being, very kind. Um, very much, in fact, in the in very same vein that Tommy Douglas was. Those who know Tommy Douglas' uh, reputation and character. Uh, Howard was very much the same way. Um, in fact, one of the stories about Tommy Douglas, if I can just share with you, that I um, was going to mention is that uh, when we were looking at correspondence of why did more people outside of the indigenous community not try to do something about residential schools. Tommy Douglas was one of the few who did, um, 1948. He undertook a letter writing campaign to the government of Canada, drawing to their attention the way that indigenous children in a, a residential school in Labrette, Saskatchewan were being treated based upon complaints of people um, who came to see him. Uh, and I'm not sure if he was the premier at that time or not. I think he was a member of parliament. Uh, but he wrote a, a lengthy series of letters to the minister and eventually to the um, editor of the Globe and Mail, trying to bring this to public attention. <clears throat> and in both cases, the minister and the prime minister of the country admonished him for trying to bring <clears throat> Uh, trying to be critical about the good work that the government and the churches were doing for Indigenous people, and uh, that uh, part of his uh, attitude was uh, was that uh, was anti-Christian. I think that's the term that was used, even though he was himself a practicing pastor, I believe. But <clears throat> he was accused of being anti-Christian and uh, being critical of the Catholics for running the schools as they did and that uh, he should just mind his own business and take care of what's wrong with Saskatchewan. So, uh, in the letter to the editor through the Globe and Mail, incidentally, uh, we asked uh, if we could take a look at the archives for the Globe and Mail to see how many letters, letters to the editor they had received from people over the 130 years prior to the residential school litigation. Uh, and uh, we unfortunately were not able to get access to those archives. Um, so I encourage any student who wants to do research to take a look at why was our Canada's leading newspaper not being more forthcoming with the public and revealing what was going on in residential schools. But let me talk about Howard. Um, I delivered the eulogy at his funeral, so that kind of indicates to you, I think, just how close we were. I worked for him very closely for the better part of four years, and he was an exceptional human being very kind, and probably the one person who, who taught me the importance of treating people with respect at every opportunity, even those you don't like, and uh, who give you no basis upon which to treat them with respect, you still must treat them with respect, because at the end of the day, this is not about them, it's about you. And so uh, I learned from him the importance of doing that and also the, how fulfilling that can be. 
to be able to to say that at the end of the day you listened and you gave them an opportunity to speak their mind, even though you didn't necessarily agree with it or maybe didn't even um, feel that there was any action that needed to be taken, at least you gave them an opportunity to voice their concern, whatever it might be. Um, but at the same time, he also reinforced for me the concept that if there is something that you can do, then you must do it. You must not sit back and let others do it. When you have the ability and the opportunity and the resources to do something, then you should do it. Now, Howard is well known for his involvement in politics, but few people know about his involvement in the community. Uh, where I grew up, he was the local MLA, but he was also uh, the chairman of the board at the Selkirk Friendship Center, and he was the chairman of the board there for years. He was a very active legal practitioner and uh, represented a number of indigenous people in courts, uh, often pro bono without charging fees. Um, and in particular, he had a, a soft spot in his heart to represent mothers who were losing their children to the child welfare system and uh, tried to do what he could while he was in practice. And then as minister, was one of the leading forces behind the evolution of Indigenous child welfare agencies in Manitoba to take responsibility for Indigenous children in First Nations communities being brought into care. Uh, so that children wouldn't be taken out of the communities, if, even if they were in need of apprehension, in other words, they needed to be protected, he always believed that the extended family or the community itself still provided the best resource for those children and sending them to the United States or to Europe or placing them in non-Indigenous foster homes. So he had a very um, open and progressive attitude towards those kinds of things. and. Um, and was a, a wonderful teacher, just a wonderful person to be involved in. And he helped uh, make me see the wisdom of going to law school. Although I do want you to know he, he sent me to law school for the wrong reason. He sent me to law school to get into politics. <laughs> and while I was in law school, I, in fact, it's almost two years ago today, at the end of May of my second year in law school in 1978, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, oh my god. Uh, at the end of May of uh, my second year in law school is when I decided that I was not going to go to, into politics, I was going to practice law. And so I had to do that in order to pick the courses for my third year. And so I picked all of the uh, litigation courses that I could get in order to be able to practice law when I got out of law school. And. Uh, so I've kind of reversed the situation where I went to law school to get into politics, but instead I got into law and then got into politics later. So I, um, and, and I have to say that uh, and Nancy Ruth, my former colleague in the Senate is here, she might be able to verify this. Being involved in uh, the Senate, in politics in the Senate, is kind of like being in constant litigation where every day you go to court and you're arguing with somebody about something uh, and it's almost always initially about something irrelevant <laughs> in order to get to the relevant part. <laughs> thank you. I'll take, we'll take a question from the side. Okay, thank you. Um, so hi, Murray. It's great. It's an honor to be here with you today. Um, I have a question for you a little bit off the topic of um, Indigenous ways of knowing. It's more geared towards the missing and murdered Indigenous women of Canada. Um, so as an Indigenous woman, I'm, I was watching the process as it unfolded from the very beginning. And it just, it kind of, it progressed in a meaningful way and then it stopped and it kind of seemed to go backwards and then it, it moved forward again. and. I'm concerned with where it's at right now. And I guess my question to you is, do you see yourself getting involved in this commission in the future to help, I guess, make it progress forward in a, in a good way? Do I see myself getting involved, sir? In the, the mi missing and murdered women, in the commission part of it, um, planning. I'm not sure how there would be any further room for involvement. My concern is, um, with the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Inquiries that we had one chance to do, to do it and get it right. 
Right. And I think we've almost blown it. Exactly. Uh, I have a real concern about whether the process is going to lead to a productive end. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be that their final report that comes from this particular inquiry uh, will change my mind about that. Okay. But uh, at this point in time, given the, the, the history of the chaos that's been going on internally within the inquiry and the difficulties that it's engendered for those who want to participate, particularly the, the families the, of the victims, and the, um, their inability to do so in a meaningful way, according to many of them. Uh, and also um, because there's not a lot of transparency yet about what kind of research work and what kind of uh, background investigatory work they've been doing and can talk about. Uh, I don't know what to anticipate from this report. Um, but I can say that I had a lot of hope for it at the beginning. I worked closely with the commissioners to help them get their thinking around how to do an inquiry and, and what we learned from the TRC process. And, uh, and I, I have to say that one of, the, one of the problems from the beginning always was the limited mandate. Okay. It, had a, it had their, uh, its mandate was far too limited. And uh, I even said to them, if it had been offered to me, uh, I wouldn't have accepted that mandate because that mandate prevented you from looking at files, RCMP files or police files uh, that were still considered open investigations. And one way that police always avoid um, being held responsible for crimes that they can't um, determine or conclude is to call them open files. And, and a file can sit open for 25 or 30 years. And many of them, in fact, are, and uh, and that's no, that's that's not a an answer, and that shouldn't be treated as a complete answer to the issue. But I know that the mandate was negotiated with government, okay. and the government created the inquiry. It was our call to action that they founded it upon. But our call to action did not talk about giving it a limited inquiry. We said it had to be a as full an inquiry as possible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, Cody Zachariah, uh, graduate in business. Uh, hello. Sego Zewaguigo, Hatari Koraga, Young Cats, Citero Kantege, Kanyangahaga. Thank you for being here. Um, Senator Sinclair, we, we've met a few times before as yep. part of a youth council. We met in Parliament a couple months ago. Um, but I wanted to stop leaning in. Um, <laughs> I had a question about um, indoctrination. And I have a daughter who's 19 months, and something I'm scared of is her going through the same indoctrination that I went through in the Canadian school system. Um, and I'm not sure whether to homeschool her or, or, or do, I don't, I don't know what to do, but I, I, I don't want her to go through the same cycle of, of learning the Canadian context and not having the Indigenous history that I went through, and then having to relearn that in some sort of a culture shock even at like in my teenage years and early 20s. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any advice on, on how to raise children in this day and age um, when you want them to have the Indigenous knowledge that the school boards just don't have or don't offer. Thank you. My wife would be laughing uproariously at the fact that you're asking me how to raise children. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm Bear, Bear Clan too. And my, so my, my default position is always let your wife give you direction when it comes to those things. Um, but the one thing I do know that when we talked about our children, and, and we talked frequently about that very issue when our children were being born and being um, placed into various educational environments, uh, we always talked about the fact that we knew we were placing them into an educational environment that would repeat the kind of education that we had received ourselves as children. And we tried to... Um, determine whether we could do something about that. Um, so we decided as parents that what we would do is we would create an educational environment for our children while still allowing them to participate in the public school system because that public school system is their best vehicle to get uh, the kind of career that they would want to have and we would want them to have. So I have a son who's got a PhD in literature and teaches at university. I have a daughter who's got a master's in um, 
in uh, language development as well. I have a daughter who's got a master's and uh, in indigenous governance from Harvard University. Um, I have a daughter who's a manager for uh, indigenous tourism, who's uh, got a business background. And I have a daughter who works in writing code for computers. Um, but all of them know their culture. And all of them know their culture because we created, along with other parents of similar mind to us, we created an educational environment for them in our house. And we brought in grandmothers, and we asked them, before our children started school, we asked the grandmothers to speak to the children only in the language and to teach them whatever they wanted those little children to know about what it was like or what it was going to be like to be a human being. And so we put our children into the hands of grandmothers uh, from the age of three until they were ready to start school. And then we looked, while they were in school, we looked for every opportunity to continue that kind of treatment, uh, uh, educational treatment, um, whenever we could. Uh, so we helped the school division establish the Ojibwe language program. We helped the school division establish uh, uh, Aboriginal content in their history course. Uh, so we worked with the school division at a time, and, and I have to admit, I, I know that uh, part of my ability to influence that had to do with my, uh, the fact that I was a judge and I had done the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry and had some public profile, but the schools were very receptive to it and they saw the wisdom of it. So my suggestion is that in, engage with your community to engage your, the first teachers, remember, of every child, the first teacher of every child is the mother. That's our teaching, I'm sure it's yours as well. The first teacher is the mother. And so the, the mothers and the aunties and the grandmothers are the ones who will always be the first teachers of every child. And so that's why we put together that preschool program for our children in that way. Just as we think it would have happened in a traditional setting 200 years ago. And when they were finished educating those children and those children started off in the public school system, they could all speak Ojibwe, the children. Wab Canoe was one of them, for example. And our daughters could all speak the language and they knew their culture, they knew their name, and they were able to stand up for themselves and challenge any teacher who, who said differently. My granddaughter, in fact, uh, just got into a confrontation with a substitute teacher in her school because he said the wrong thing about indigenous people. And she called him on it in front of the whole class and he threw her out of the classroom. So she went to the principal, told the principal, the principal came in and fired the substitute teacher. <laughs> So it's, um, it, it'll, it'll work, it, but you have to take responsibility as a parent. So, okay. it's Me not much. easy. Right. <laughs> okay, we'll come back over here for another question. Thank you. Yes, sir. my name is Michael Chino. I'm a residential school survivor. I went to two residential schools. And uh, it's been uh, three years, almost three years since the TRC report came out. And uh, my question is, uh, to the settlers of this land, are we moving toward truth, healing, and reconciliation? Your question is for me to respond to that? <laughs> All right. Uh, the answer is yes, um, but it's going to take time. It's slow. It's always going to be slow. Because this is like changing the direction of an iceberg. There's nobody in charge of the thing, and uh, it's about trying to figure out how we're going to affect a change in the direction. And it's about getting everybody on, on one, to, to get to one side of the boat and paddle like hell mm -hmm. to make it change direction to start with. So right now, I'd have to say that we haven't seen the kind of change that I think we're ultimately going to see in two or three generations, but we're, we are going to see change because we are seeing this kind of conversation going on in many places. And when you have this kind of conversation, then you have an equal number of opportunities for people to undertake to do something. So. Senator. All right. Next, thank you. 
Hi, Senator. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Christine Yap. I'm a faculty at the college here, and I'm really blessed to be able to um, implement some of the Indigenous learning into my courses, which I'm really, really pleased about. One of the things that I'm struggling with is my children's school. So as I think it was Cody, his name is, um, talked about, I have a six and an eight-year-old at school in a private school. And one of the things that is happening is they're being taught about Indigenous education, but it's lies. So Wait, which, I, I'm sorry? It's yeah, lies. Speak into the mic, please. Oh, it's lies. Sorry. Yeah. Better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when, I, when my daughter brought home her textbook, I actually shared this with my team. When her brought her, her, my daughter brought home her textbook, the information in it was completely incorrect. I literally went back to her school and I threw out the textbook. Um, and I told the teachers that I didn't want her learning this. And I, I basically gave my daughter the right language to be utilizing instead of, and I'll tell you, it said that um, Westerners and Indigenous people worked well together. And I legitimately was like, no, this is not the truth. So yeah, we I sat, have a We sat by the campfire and sang Kumbaya. I know right. that. <laughs> so I have a great platform here. But I don't have a great platform in a place like my daughter's school, which is a private school. And I'm wanting, wondering how you would think about going about penetrating that, like those systems in order for us to build education with it, particularly for our younger children. Because those children are coming into the college and they don't know anything that's going on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, you have to, uh, I think you have to understand when you're, when you're fighting at an individual level, it takes individual fighting. So you have to have individual fighting skills. And I'm not talking physically, I'm talking when you have that debate going on between yourself and another person. You have to be armed with the knowledge, you have to be able to articulate that knowledge, you have to be able to articulate that knowledge convincingly. So it is a one-on-one -on -one situation. But when you're dealing with an institutional setting, when you're dealing with trying to change the way an institution functions, the, uh, the best vehicle, in my view, that uh, can affect change at that level or is another institution or another, um, another uh, entity that can take it on uh, and challenge the way that it functions. And, and so I think what you need to do is if you can't find an entity like that who currently exists, then you create one, like we did with the uh, preschool program that we created for our children. Uh, we actually incorporated an entity and then we, we created a voluntary board of parents and we hired all these grandmothers and paid them a dollar a year plus all the food they could eat. And, um, and then we found a place, uh, uh, the school division eventually agreed to give us space in a school that we could use to teach the children and because uh, eventually we started off, there were only five children with all of the various parents that we knew. But within the first six months, we grew to 40 children. And by the end of the year, we were at 170 children who wanted to participate in this kind of a preschool program. So we had to do it in a, in a classroom setting and in order to allow them to be able to function. So we had classes. We had sessions in the morning, session in the afternoon, five days a week, and not every child went every day. Um, sometimes they'd go two or three times a week, but they got something from it. And so I think you need to think about fighting fire with fire literally uh, at that level. So you gotta haul out the big guns. Uh, if, if I may, I, I actually have a for instance. Uh, it was a uh, faculty member, Bill, Mo Bill Knox, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing. His daughter was in French immersion and the textbook had on the cover uh, like Coeur de Bois with uh, indigenous men cringing in the bottom of the canoe while the Coeur de Bois pa paddles fiercely on. And so he went to the teacher first and then got, no, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Of course it's absurd. And then he went to the principal, and it ended up a three-year letter campaign at the superintendent and the internal board. But eventually, he got that book banned. <laughs> so <laughs> takes determination, but it can be done. So I hope you don't mind me sharing that. Okay, we'll take a question here. Thanks, Senator. And for the rest of you parents, incidentally, when you see that kind of educational material, 
uh, those kinds of books being used for your children, keep in mind that even for non-Indigenous children to be taught the wrong thing is just as bad for society as it is for the Indigenous children being taught that. Yes. <clears throat> we don't need to perpetuate those myths. Thank you. I'll take your question. Thank you. Um, I am very grateful for occasions like this um, that I can learn more. Um, I do my best to be an ally. I'm very aware of my privilege. Um, but when I hear statistics like the number of Indigenous children being taken into care, when I look at things like Colton Bushi. Um, it's so overwhelming. And the thing that I run into the most with my settler friends is sheer ignorance that the indigenous peoples of North America were, and to some extent continue to be, victims of genocide. Um, a few years back, I really pissed off a Jewish friend when on the um, day to commemorate the Holocaust, I said, when is there going to be a day of remembrance for the genocide of North American First Nations people? Mm. And thank you. I mean, to me, that's, that's just so obvious, you know? But, um, and, and please, if there are any Jewish people in the room, I mean no disrespect at all. Um, but I came to learn after that conflict that Hitler studied the treatment of the indigenous peoples of North America. South African apartheid was based on the treatment of indigenous peoples of North America. So it, it's kind of, of funny, strange, not funny, haha, -ha, how my putting my foot in my mouth came to be a learning opportunity. Um, I don't know how to deal with somebody insisting that smallpox blankets never really happened and all these stories of the horrors committed against the people who lived here, as you said, sir, for tens of thousands of years before, you know, European settlers. How, how, do, how do you deal with that? How, how best can I, as, as a settler, as an ally, try to raise awareness among my peers. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's, uh, it's actually the most frequent question I get, and it is uh, similar to this wording, and that is, what can I do? And, and I always tell people that it begins with you, so you need to think about the way that you talk, the way that you think, and what it is that you know, and change that. Yeah, if necessary, but certainly increasing your level of knowledge so that you can articulate these issues in a, in a convincing and forceful manner when necessary is important. Uh, keep in mind that there are always going to be the naysayers out there that will never admit to anything that you say. Uh, and I don't waste my time very much with any of them, um, except in the Senate where I have to waste my time. <laughs> with some of them, but um, many of the um, naysayers that are out there do come from a position of lack of knowledge, or what you call ignorance, and uh, I think given an opportunity for many, uh, if treated properly, if raised in a proper way, can allow them to show, in fact, that they are as much victims of this past as we are in a different way. But um, that victimization or that sense of victimization does not appall them because it has put them into positions of privilege. And, th and that's the difficulty, that they, they, can't, they don't see it as a problem to be the beneficiaries of the privilege. They see it as a problem uh, only if they're somehow in a negative position. And for them, the problem is when other people who don't seem entitled to what they have are making claims for what they have. And that, to them, is the problem. So, so the answer to your question is uh, you do need to learn how to do that articulation. You do need to be prepared to confront it. Um, but spend time with those people who are open to change and who are prepared to work with you to do something about this. 
And to also recognize that it will always be necessary to maintain a level of public presence that will countervail against those who are speaking the negative side of things. So you always have to fight. <laughs> Senator Lynn Back. Um, the uh, Lee Barakal just told me that uh, uh, to the question uh, October 12th is set aside as a day for grieving residential school survivors and the Canadian genocide. No, what is it? The genocide. The genocide. The genocide. Miigwech. Susan? I think take Rosa. She's been waiting okay. longer. Okay. Rosa. Thank you. Rosa Duran. Thank you. Your question? Uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and reminding us that being a survivor is to be strong and determined. And in that context, I ask this question. We have, we're all part of, uh, part of the George Brown College community, uh, but I see that leaders of our community are here. And my question is, what can we as a community and as leaders in this community, what can we do together to change the way that we teach our, our students, all of our students, um, some practical ways that you have seen uh, other institutions leading in this in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are probably three things you need to think about. One is you need to form an action team. So you have to have people who are prepared to undertake the work. And it's not, it's not a, a, a small job. It's um, going to require time and effort because it'll require initially intellectual capacity and intellectual ability. And sometimes that means you have to add to your knowledge base. So you have to do things like read the TRC report, at least a summary, so you know what it is that you're talking about and you know the facts. Uh, but you also, from that, need to determine what the action is that you can engage in and agree on the action that you're going to want to undertake. And keep in mind that there are so many different fronts upon which you can take action that you have to be selective because if you try to tackle, tackle them all, you will um, be spinning in confusion from one to the other. Uh, so you have to stay focused and uh, pick the one that you can do and do it. And, uh, and, but forming that team of indigenous, non-indigenous people to do, develop that vision and to determine what the action plan is that you're going to be able to put into place and making it happen is key. And it, everybody can do something. You know, I, I, um, everybody knows Clara Hughes, right? The Olympic athlete. She, she was one of our honorary witnesses, and she and her uh, family were very involved in the TRC process. She came to all of our national events, and she brought her mother to a few of them. Uh, Clara's mother is a wonderful, wonderful, warm human being, uh, but uh, uh, did not complete her high school, so she didn't have very much of a public school education. But she was uh, very intrigued by the work that Clara was involved in, both in the area of the mental health work that Clara does, as well as the TRC work. And so she came to learn about this. And so she decided, as part of her commitment to action, that she was going to gather together all of the grandmothers that she knew, who were her friends, and invite them over to tea. And she was going to talk to them about what she had learned at the TRC national events. And then she decided, well, maybe she should read the calls to action. So she read the calls to action. And then she decided to read the summary of the TRC report, and so she read that. Uh, as preparation for her uh, granny tea meeting, as she called them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so she was uh, getting organized for that, and then she decided that she would need a speaker to come in, so she got Clara to come to the first one and explain what the TRC was all about. And, and eventually this all mushroomed so that now they call upon deputy ministers to come and explain, why aren't you doing something about this? Exactly. And this little tea granny group has turned into a... Uh, it's almost like a, um, a, you know, a den of uh, cross-examination that everybody walks into. Because <laughs> you have to go in prepared to explain what you're doing about this. And, uh, but the best part of her story when I was talking to her was 
She said that they're now involving their children, the grandmothers are bringing their children, their, particularly their daughters and their granddaughters to these gatherings because they, as women, they want to be involved. And so one of them brought a granddaughter who was uh, uh, pregnant and about to give birth to a baby. And at that particular event that she was at, she saw a video in which I spoke and she, the, the granddaughter said, I love Justice Sinclair. Mm -hmm. I think he is the best human being ever. And I'm going to name my baby after him. <laughs> and so she did. So somewhere in Winnipeg, there's a little boy named Justice. She thought my first name was Justice. <laughs> so she named her son Justice. And so I met him. He's a bright guy. He's got potential. So. Thank, Thank you. Much. Susan? Thank you so much for being here. I don't know if everyone knows, but there are buttons out in the hallway that community worker students are making. And I selected the beaver and the eagle for wisdom and love. And I love wisdom, and I appreciate yours very much. So I'm going to ask you a difficult question. I read uh, some articles from a handbook on reconciliation that was put together in 2017 by the province of British Columbia. It's a great resource for post-secondary, and I'm really interested in everything in it. But I read something that was troublesome, and I think that troubling information is really important on our path to greater understanding. So I'm going to ask you to help me reconcile something. It's reconciling the idea that reconciliation is, in fact, recolonization. And this comes from an article that was written by Tayaki Alfred from Cornell, an indigenous, an indigenous scholar there. So he says that reconciliation is recolonization because it's allowing the colonizer to hold on to his attitudes and mentality and does not challenge his behavior. So how do we move towards reconciling that? I know critique is important, but how do we use that productively? I don't know the entire context in which that, uh, d that thought has developed, um, and I don't know that he still holds it today, but let me respond at least to, to the concept of reconciliation as part of a recolonization process. <clears throat> it, it was certainly not intended that way. When you read the report, you, anyone would recognize that when we talked about the issue of reconciliation, we actually talked about the need for change. And in the chapter on reconciliation in our TRC report, and we have an entire 30 or 40 pages talking about what reconciliation means, we point out that reconciliation should be thought of in the same context, context, a context as one thinks about dealing with an issue of violence in a relationship. And in a domestic relationship, if you're going to continue to have a relationship going forward, you have to have a process of reconciliation in which you come to terms with the past. And sometimes that means that it's, you have to confront it, it has to be atoned for, it has to be compensated for, it has to be acknowledged, and there has to be a, a level of awareness shown that, that has occurred. But there also has to be change, that you cannot continue to behave in the future as you have in the past. Because if you continue to behave the same way as you have in the past, while you're maintaining or trying to maintain this relationship in the future, you will not have reconciliation. So reconciliation is all about change. And it's not about um, allowing people to get away with simply apologizing and moving on. Uh, and many times, and people who've heard me speak will know that many times I've said, if all you're going to do is apologize, then hang on to it because I don't need it. We need action. So uh, reconciliation needs to be thought of in terms of awareness, atonement, apology, and action. Yep. Four A's. A plus. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I, and, and I respect Tayagi's intellect. I don't agree with his thoughts most of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a question here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Anna. Um, I am part of a table that discusses the land acknowledgement uh, at the organization I work at, and I wanted to hear what's your opinion on the land acknowledgement. 
Um, I guess that's my question. And I also wanted to really, really thank you for all the stories that you've heard, that I've heard from you. Um, they've been very touching and um, and they've helped me in this learning process as an immigrant, as a woman, as a person who has indigenous blood. Um, I'm very thankful to be here and that you're here teaching us. So what's your opinion on the land acknowledgement? Thank you. <laughs> well, the land acknowledgement is not about land. Okay. Um, the land acknowledgement is not about land any more than acknowledging people who have hosted you in their home is an acknowledgement of the home or of the house. It's not about the house. It's about the people in the house. Okay. It's about their offer of invitation. It's about their acceptance of your entry. It's about their uh, willingness to share the space with you. So um, I, I, I think it's important for people to understand that the reason behind the, the land acknowledgement is the very same reason that we thank people when they invite us into their house. So when you're invited into somebody's home, you don't walk in and say, Thank you, house, for being here, and uh, <laughs> nice windows. <laughs> it's not about that at all. It's about the people who are there and the fact that they have created this house, they have created this space, and they have invited you into it, and they have accepted you into it, and they have uh, willingly engaged with you in that environment and hosted you. So um, land acknowledgement has tended to to be seen as simply an acknowledgement that we're on somebody's territory. And that, that is part of it, but it's a very small part of it to the point where it's actually a minuscule part of it. The, the part of it that's very important is acknowledging the people who are on the land or whose land it is that you are on. Mm -hmm. And that they are the ones who are important in this acknowledgement. So it's about relationship. Everything's about relationship. That's very true. Um, would you change um, the title, Land Acknowledgement, to something else? <laughs> I'm just sorry. Wait till I get, just wait I'm till I get my book of God out and I will <laughs> give the instruction as needed. Um, would I rewrite it? Would I, would I encourage people to say it in a different way? Yes, just in the same way I just did. So it's, it's about what would you say if you went into someone's house? That's what I encourage. I've been asked this before, so it's not like I wasn't aware that somebody was eventually going to ask me, but it's also created some consternation for people because they never thought of it as a similar concept to entering somebody's home. Um, so you, you don't barge in and simply say, here I am, uh, thanks for being here. But it is about acknowledging the land. And remember that the land, is, the, the land is not simply land. The land is about homeland. The land is about home. Thank you very much, Senator. OK. Thank you. Oh, OK. Your question, please. Thank you. So, uh, Satsuriakal, Buju, hello, Senator. Uh, my name is Gurpreet Singh Deepak, and I have the privilege of working with uh, Teach for Canada. And uh, since we're among scholars and I'm um, doing professional development, uh, with a growing awareness of uh, OCAP principles, I'm wondering, uh, do you believe Canadian laws will change to uh, acknowledge, honor, and respect these principles, uh, and what will it take for that change? <laughs> Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, do I believe that laws will change? <clears throat> um, well, that's a little crystal ballish for me. I, I don't know. Because everything depends upon legislators and the willingness of legislators to engage in that process. Um, but I think that laws need to be changed. I think laws are an important part of the process of reconciliation. In our calls to action, you'll see that we recommended a number of um, legal mechanisms that needed to be considered. One was a royal proclamation of reconciliation. Another was a covenant on reconciliation, much like a, a treaty process. 
<laughs> and the third was uh, <clears throat> legislation around protection of indigenous languages, um, all of which we said are very important because uh, it is the absence of those means which allows government to lapse into forgetfulness and also allows government to change its mind when there's a, an, an election of a different party into power. And we don't think that reconciliation benefits when there is that forgetfulness or intentional change. Uh, because uh, this is not about political parties and it's not about government. It's about the people of this country. And the people of this country need more than that kind of manipulation. So I, I, I would say that legislative change is necessary. Whether there's the will to make the change at this point in time, I don't know. But I, as I said, when we issued the TRC report, we did not write the report for government. We wrote the report for Canada. And literally, that meant for all the people of Canada. And that all the people of Canada needed to embrace the commitment to reconciliation and to communicate that need for reconciliation to their elected leaders so that they reflected the will of the society. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, um, so I just have a question I'm asking for a clarification. So earlier, a question was asked about missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, and you made a comment uh, about how we, we had one shot and we blew it, and I'm just wondering, what did you mean by that? Well, um, I don't know that I said I, that we blew it, but we certainly are blowing it. We're not finished yet. Yeah. Um, the process has been marred by more conflict and um, appearance of chaos than needed to be the case. And I think it's become a distraction to the process. <clears throat> this could have been an opportunity by which Canada would have been extremely well-educated and well-informed about what happened. I think the one... Uh, when I was talking with the commissioners at the outset, I said the one thing people are going to want to know is what happened. What happened to these women? Um, because we're not even sure yet what happened to them. Are they indeed all dead? Were they indeed all murdered? Were they uh, removed from the country? What happened to them? We need to be able to answer that question. And then we can ask the related questions of why. Why did it happen? And what do we do about it? And who's responsible for doing what about it? So all of those related questions flow from that very first question, and that is, what happened? And I don't know yet that we are going to be able to know or learn at the end of the day what happened. I have very grave concerns about that. But if we learn what happened, then I think we will be in a better position to start answering those other questions. And I don't know yet whether we know, because the educational possibilities that were inherent in the public hearings process have faded. We're only six months away from the end of the term of this inquiry, and there's been no indication that it's going to be extended, so I don't know what we're going to get at the end of the day. Do you feel like, um, I guess, like truth and reconciliation is possible in like these kinds of systems? It'll have to be. It'll have to be determined. It'll have to be determined in a different way mm -hmm. than this process. I don't see this government or any government, perhaps, in the future, because with so many governments were engaged in this process. I don't see them willingly engaging in a similar process in the future, and. Um, but I still think that we are going to, there is a very distinct possibility that we're going to be left with as many questions at the end of the day as we had going in. And therefore, the question always is, what are we going to be able to do about that? Thank you. Thank you. I'm told we have time for one more question. So I'd like to know who's been standing longer. Do we know? We don't know. I have been standing the longest. <laughs> you, you definitely have, and you're putting me to shame. Okay, I'm going to, yep, you in blue, please. Hello, my name is Corrine, 
And I recently uh, had the privilege of speaking with a survivor in You need to speak into the mic. I can't hear you, I'm afraid. My, my name is Kareen, and yeah. I recently had the privilege of speaking with a survivor from Saskatchewan who shared her story with me, and I was heartbroken. I don't have a lot of um, interaction with our First Nations and Indigenous people. However, my grandfather was the Attorney General for Tommy Douglas until 1964. And I've gone back and looked at the record and in Hansard, and out of my own knowledge of my grandfather's heart, I know there was no, it's my understanding, there was no intentional plan to wipe out uh, a whole group of people, certainly not in the hearts and minds of the men of the CCF. I'd like to try to understand why uh, so many thousands of children were um, put into these homes, into these residential schools, and uh, how, what, how you think that came to pass, if you agree with me that there was no um, overt, malicious, Hitler-esque intention to wipe out people. Thank you. Uh yeah, I'm, I'm not sure um, what you're referring to when you say there's no overt official policy. There actually was a very clear policy beginning in the 1880s. Sir John A. Macdonald in Parliament stood and spoke and said that the intention was to remove children from their parents so that the parents' influence over them could be uh, taken away from them and that they would be placed into these schools for the purpose of being... Um, he didn't use the word assimilated, but integrated into Canadian society, uh, free from the burden of being Indian. And uh, the, uh, the concept that he followed was uh, the, identical to the concept that was being uh, enunciated very clearly in the United States and it had been contained in a report that he had commissioned from a fellow named Nicholas Davin. And Nicholas Davin had studied the Indian boarding school system in the United States. The Indian boarding school system was founded on the principle of kill the Indian in the man, which is get rid of their culture, get rid of their language. And when you look at the uh, definition of genocide that uh, was favored and developed by the uh, you know, United Nations, originally it was agreed that the, the concept of genocide included any attempt by any nation to eliminate a racial group, either physically through means like starvation or murder, or culturally through taking away children, and it's, it's in Article 2E of the Convention on Genocide, the forcible removal of children to place them with a cultural group or a racial group distinct from their own racial group so that their own racial group will eventually be eliminated is an act of genocide. And so it was an act of genocide from the very beginning. And uh, we couldn't say so in our report at the TRC because we had a limit in our mandate that said we could not pronounce on criminal uh, responsibility. So we took it as far as we could. But uh, we know what we intended, and everybody else knows what we intended to say. Uh, and the. The fact of the matter is that from the very beginning, it was always an intention to eliminate Indian people as a race. And Duncan Campbell Scott in the 1920s, when he was introducing amendments to the Indian Act, also said that the intention of government was to eliminate the Indian problem by eliminating Indians as an identifiable group, so that at the end of the day, there is no Indian who has not been absorbed into the body politic. So that's a very clear a uh, statement that the intention all along was to wipe out the race of people known as in Indian people. So. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Um, and now it's my distinct pleasure to thank the Senator for his uh, generosity and humility in answering the questions and the time he spent with us. Senator, you will be forever embedded in our history as the person who led that effort to document those atrocities and start to turn that iceberg. Jimmy sir. Thank you. Uh, also, the
selfie time. Isn't it? Yeah, I hope so. Somebody get a picture of us. Uh, thank you so much as a small gift, a token of appreciation. And uh, before you go, I want to recognize Chandra Boodoo as the woman, Chandra, who initiated this whole thing and started the momentum to get you here. Miigwech. <laughs> and now, uh, Rush Boodoo, uh, the coordinator, Tommy Douglas, will uh, come and let you all know what's going on for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. So just a couple more notes, but again, we're all thrilled. This is a dream long held to have Senator Sinclair come to the Tommy Douglas Institute and George Brown College. So it so far has been a phenomenal day. Um, it will continue to be so. So a couple more notes. Um, uh, we have a community open space where there are interactive exhibits and cold water and fruit and all sorts of refreshments. Um, so please um, circulate, um, enjoy the space. Then at 12.15, we have seven breakout talking circles. Um, uh, very interesting um, discussions will be happening there. We have a dynamic group of facilitators who will be leading those discussions. At 2.30, we're all coming back to this room um, where we will have a panel talking about the path toward reconciliation in education and community work, and a, uh, a very a surprise performance, not a surprise, I just told you, but a fantastic performance um, for you to, uh, to open that. And I just want to draw your attention to our artist, Jack Pierpoint, who is going to be capturing the entire day in drawing. And so, there you go, there's Jack. So, and the breakouts will also um, have lunch. Um, power bowls that were created by our uh, chef, David Wolfman. Um, so please enjoy, enjoy the breakouts, and I'll see everyone back here at 2.30. Enjoy the day. <laughs>